pray. Lord, we just thank you that we can be here on this Easter Sunday. I pray that you would just bless our time together as we worship you from different places, but as one voice, worshiping you and praising your name. Amen. Amen. grave he lay Jesus my Savior waiting the coming day Jesus my Lord up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes he arose a victor from the dark domain Father, we ask that as we celebrate today, you would receive honor and glory, that you would remind us of all that is good and gracious, and that we would lift up your name in praise. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I just don't want to remind you that we are practicing social distancing here at Living Hope Church, and that's part of the reason that you see the worship team. Uh, they actually recorded this service on the 2nd of April, and um, now we are not going over to church we're practicing even more social distancing so i'm recording this from one of the rooms at my home let's sing together again come bless the lord come bless the lord come bless the lord he is risen come bless the lord come bless the lord Bless the Lord, He is risen. Come bless the Lord, come bless the Lord, come bless the Lord, He is risen. Come bless the Lord, come bless the Lord, come bless the Lord, He is risen. Heaven's joy, creation's King, left the throne to save us. Born of love for suffering, on the cross forgave us. Come bless the Lord, come bless the Lord, come bless the Lord, He is risen. Come bless the Lord, come bless the Lord, come bless the Lord, He is risen. On the cross our debt was paid. Jesus died rejected, three days in the grave he lay, now he's resurrected. Come bless the Lord, come bless the Lord, come bless the Lord.
bless the Lord, He is risen. Come bless the Lord, come bless the Lord, come bless the Lord, He is risen. Amen. His resurrection ushered in a new existence, one that because he lives, we can face our future, our lives tomorrow. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he lived and died to buy my pardon, an empty grave is there to prove. My Savior lives Because He lives I can face tomorrow Because He lives All fear is gone Because I know He holds a future And life is just because he lives how sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives but greater still the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives, because he lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know. Because he lives And then one day I'll cross the river I'll fight life's fight No war with pain And then as death Gives way to victory I'll see the light of glory and I'll know he reigns because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know he holds a future is worth the living just because he lives. Let's pray together. Our gracious Father, I thank you for the opportunity we have to get together remotely. I pray that you would draw each of us unto you. Help us to connect with one another through phone calls and emails and chats. And I pray, Lord, that you would lift us up that you would bring healing to those that are sick, that you bring comfort to us as we stay home, and that you would, above all, use this present pandemic to bring honor and glory to Jesus Christ. May those in our circle of acquaintance come to know you. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you would draw our friends to Jesus and make them ambassadors of Christ. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's continue worshiping our Lord, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus celebrate, celebrate Jesus 
Redeemer is, my Redeemer is, my Redeemer is. This Easter Sunday morning, I want to turn us to the book of Job. We're going to look at a passage which we often remember but seldom look at in context. It's Job chapter 19, verse 23 through 27. These are the words of Job. Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and lead they were engraved in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives... And at the last he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. I know my Redeemer lives. This is the Word of God. On Thursday night of Holy Week, Jesus washed the disciples' feet, and gave them the great commandment to love one another. That's why we um, celebrate Monday Thursday on the Thursday night before Easter. On that day, the disciples received the mandate or the command to love one another. And then Jesus sat with his disciples and they ate together what we now call the Last Supper. We call it the Last Supper because it was the last meal the disciples would eat with Jesus before his arrest, his trial, and his crucifixion. At the beginning of the week, the disciples had walked alongside Jesus as he rode into Jerusalem in fulfillment of the prophecy of Zechariah. They were there when the crowd shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! It probably seemed that there was nothing but good times on the horizon. But by the time Thursday has come around, a plot has been hatched to have Jesus arrested and put to death. Conflict with the spiritual leaders of his day has heated up. And Jesus has been talking more and more about his death. And then, in the midst of a prayer meeting, Jesus was arrested. On Friday, a sham of a trial was held, a trial which probably started a little after 7 a.m. and was over by 9 o'clock in the morning. By noon, Jesus was on the cross. The sky was darkened as our Savior met his death. At around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he cried out, It is finished. And Jesus was dead. A week which started with so much promise has, has ended in the worst possible way for the disciples. Among the disciples, Judas wouldn't live to see Saturday, his name forever synonymous with betrayal. Judas was such a pessimist that he took his own life. And he did so even before Jesus was sentenced. Before Pilate had finished questioning Jesus, Judas was dead. Before Barabbas was released, Judas was dead. Before Jesus was scourged with the whip, Judas had taken his life. Before the crown of thorns had been pushed upon his head, Judas was dead. Before they nailed Jesus to the cross, Judas had given up all hope. He had checked out. He had killed himself. One of the most significant lessons of Easter is this. Don't give up. It's Friday, but Sundays are coming. And, of course, none of the disciples knew for certain what was going to happen on that Sunday. They didn't understand the teaching of Jesus about him coming back to life after, until after he actually did. Whereas Judas allowed his despair to lead him to take his own life, the other disciples certainly had their moments of doubt and betrayal, of pain and sorrow, of fear and discouragement. 
Joseph of Arimathea takes the body of Jesus and lays it in a tomb. And the disciples do what people always do after a burial. They go home with emptiness in their hearts. What we call Good Friday appeared to be to them to be anything but good. For them it was just crucifixion day. On the day of the crucifixion, all the followers of Jesus Christ dispersed in despair. His death upon the cross shattered the dreams and the faith of his apostles. We have experienced nothing like it. It is hard to imagine, but for a moment, walk with the disciples. Experience the deep emotional distress of the loss of Jesus without the resurrection. And that is Friday of crucifixion week. And that is Saturday, the day after Christ is placed in the tomb. We know resurrection day is coming, but for them, it looked like just another day to mourn. I imagine the disciples sitting together on Saturday morning in shock, in despair, not knowing what's going to come next. For hundreds of years before the death of Jesus, the Jews had been burying their dead on the slope of the Mount of Olives as it faced the Temple Mount. They did this in, in anticipation of a resurrection because it was from this cemetery that the Jews believed that the resurrection of the dead would begin once the Messiah came. He did come, but instead of burying him on the holy soil of the Mount of Olives, they placed his body in a cave. On the Mount of Olives today, there are about 150,000 graves. And there are stones which tell the stories of those who are buried there, much like our gravestones. On the Saturday between Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday, I, I have it in my mind that, that the disciples might have discussed a lot of different things. What did Jesus mean by some of the things that he said and did? And eventually it turned to, how will we remember Jesus? What might we write on his gravestone? Someone probably suggested, here lies the death of hope. Or, here lies a good man too early taken from us. Another would suggest, he came to give us life, and we gave him death. Others would recount significant events in his life, like he walked on water, or he fed 5,000, he healed the sick, or some, hearkening back to just a few days, would say, love one another. Or maybe John would say, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only son. What should be written on that stone? How will they remember Jesus? And it's actually a biblical writer who answered this question. We referred to him already. It comes from the book of Job. An unlikely source for an Easter message, but, but a significant message because of what it contains. The words of Job begin, Oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead and engraved in rock forever. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. This is the word of the Lord. Job, Job would have us inscribe upon a rock this lasting memorial, a final statement left for generations to read. 
words of hope, words of faith, words of peace. They come from Job, chapter 19, verses 23 to 27. You know, Job, who, who walked through crises like none of us have ever experienced. Job, who knew all about losing his family. Job, who knew all about losing your wealth. Job, who knew all about suffering horrendously for your health. Job says, I know my Redeemer lives. Centuries before the crucifixion of Christ, Job celebrated Easter. He celebrated the certainty of the resurrection. The words seem so simple and so positive. I know my Redeemer lives. Job, of course, lived through great struggles and strife in life. No one would have judged him had he given up hope. His own wife recommended he give up hope. He had every reason to believe that God had abandoned him. He had every reason to blame God for his troubles. He had very little reason to hope. And yet, his faith remains solid. He says without hesitation, I know my Redeemer lives. This is the basic truth of Easter. The resurrection of Christ remains the great unshakable reality of the ages. I know my Redeemer lives. No matter what is happening around us, no matter what is falling apart, no matter what the, the government says, no matter what our neighbors say, we know this, our Redeemer lives. We know our Redeemer lives. The, resur the resurrection of Christ presents us with a faith which is relevant today. The resurrection of Christ is the only thing which makes our faith worthwhile. The resurrection is the pinnacle upon which the whole of our faith stands. We serve a risen Savior. This is the promise. This is the hope. This is the wonder of Easter. I know my Redeemer lives. I find it interesting that the disciples didn't expect the resurrection. Jesus had taught them about it numerous times. Three times in the Synoptic Gospels, or very specifically, Jesus teaches that he's going to rise again. Look what it says in Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 and 22. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Of course, the disciples didn't want to believe that, so Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Apparently, Peter was so convinced it would never happen to him, when the first half of it happened, he, he, he couldn't fathom the second half, to be raised from the dead. Then look also on, <coughs> on Matthew 17, verses 22 and 23. As they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man, that would be a reference to himself, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. The disciples were greatly distressed. It's very plain. Jesus said, he's going to die, but he will be raised again. And then how about Matthew chapter 20, verses 17 and to 19. And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside, and on the way he said to them, See, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And here's the kicker. And he will be raised on the third day. Jesus clearly taught his disciples that he would rise again. But somehow they didn't get it. They, they couldn't fathom it. So Easter Sunday morning comes, resurrection morning comes, and the disciples are still in mourning. And interestingly, it's, it's not as though the religious leaders weren't clear about this. 
They understood what Jesus was teaching. If you look at Matthew 27, verses 62 and following, the, the next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priest and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter, that they're referring there to Jesus, how that imposter said while he was alive, After three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he is risen from the dead. It was common knowledge. The, the, the scribes and the Pharisees knew that Jesus had predicted he would rise again. But the disciples on, on Resurrection Sunday, they're sitting around with their heads held low. So on the third day, when the resurrection was about to happen, the disciples are nowhere to be found. They were told that it would happen, but they didn't believe it. Even the women who went to the tomb, when they, they were just going to, to remember and to, to pay their respects. It's interesting, and when John writes in his gospel early on in John chapter 2, he tells us that after the resurrection, the disciples started to remember what Jesus had taught. But Job... Long before the, Jesus walked on this earth, anticipated the resurrection when he wrote, I know my Redeemer lives. We celebrate Easter because our Redeemer lives. The empty grave reminds us that our Redeemer lives. I had the privilege of traveling to Jerusalem a year ago, and it was such a wonder, and I thank those of you that made it possible. It's interesting, in Jerusalem there are actually two sites believed to be where Jesus was laid in a tomb. One of them more pop popular, one of them called Calvary's, uh, uh, Gordon's Calvary, and each of them have some reasons why they believe that's where Jesus was laid to rest. And I, I found an interesting thing. We don't know for sure which cave he was laid in, but we know this. Both of them are empty. Jesus is alive. Job, in the midst of his misery, celebrated the fact that his Redeemer lives, and so can we. But that's not all. Job not only celebrated the certainty of the resurrection, but he celebrated the certainty of the second coming. Listen to Job 19, verse 25. I know that in the end, he will stand upon the earth. This is an amazingly forward-thinking text. It is one thing to be assured that our Redeemer lives, to assert that Jesus is alive, but here Job looks forward to that great and coming day, when Jesus will return and walk upon the earth again. Jesus has risen from the dead, he has ascended into heaven, and he is coming back to take his stand upon the earth. Jesus is coming again. This is the enduring promise of Easter. 1 Thessalonians 4 says it this way, We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and that the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And we who are still alive will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Easter rolls around each year to remind us not only that our Redeemer lives, but that he is coming again. Jesus is coming again. This is part of the core belief of what the Christian faith entails. That Jesus Christ was crucified and upon the cross and he died and he rose again. He ascended into heaven and he is coming back. Every month we celebrate communion and we read these words from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Words which remind us of the death of Jesus on our behalf. Words which remind us of the Last Supper the new covenant which, in which we are made right with God. And we read this, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 
There's a time when we will not celebrate communion again. We do it only until he comes. And, and a part of our communion celebration is the anticipation that Jesus is coming again. The significance of Easter lies not merely in the price Jesus paid for our sins, but in the fact that the one who rose from the dead has ascended into heaven and he's coming again. <clears throat> we know our Redeemer lives, and that he will, in the end, stand upon the earth. Although at Easter our faith looks to the past, when on that wonderful morning the women and then the disciples found the tomb empty, our faith looks not only to the past, but it looks forward to that great and coming, coming day when the trumpet will sound with a shout of an archangel, when Jesus will descend and he will gather his people to himself because we know that Jesus is coming again. Job found solace in his belief that his Redeemer lives. We he found solace in the confidence that no matter what was happening to him, no matter what was happening around him, his Redeemer would walk on this earth. During our present season of uncertainty, with social distancing and, and fear of an unseen enemy of germs that we can't detect, we celebrate that our Redeemer lives and that he will return. There is one other truth that which Job brought, which brought Job comfort, and which comforts us today. Job, it seems, celebrated the certainty of heaven. In Job nineteen twenty six, he says, "I shall see God. I will see Him for myself with my own eyes, not through someone else's eyes, but I shall see God." Isn't that incredible to think of Job projecting forward to the time when he would see God, when he would enter into glory? Job had this solid, rock-solid hope. No matter what his present circumstances, Job had hope. Hope for the present and hope for the future. As we celebrate Easter today, we hold on to hope from the past into the future and available today. Paul puts it this way, if we have hope in Christ only for this life, we are of most men to be pitied. What hope is there for the future if we don't believe in the resurrection? Without the resurrection, we are left with either of two dismal choices. Uh, the concept of, re of reincarnation, where we live this life and eventually we die and we become something else and, and we have this hope that eventually we reach some sort of perfection, which nobody ever reaches, by the way, but we just have this endless cycle of reincarnation, which, which offers us no hope other than eternal bondage to an unreachable goal. The other opportunity or alternative is the idea of annihilation, that we live in this life, we eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And that's not any better. To believe that there is no life after the grave is a sorry existence, and it produces all sorts of philosophical tensions. What treat would it be to know that the 70 or so years that we spend here on, life, on, on earth is all there is to life. If there's no resurrection, if there's no final accounting for our actions, then morality is meaningless. Selfishness ought to rule the day. If we just die and are no longer, why would we not grab for all the gusto we can get? Morality becomes totally meaningless without the resurrection, without the anticipation of meeting God someday. If the resurrection is a delusion, we are to be pitied for wasting our life. But here's the good news. The resurrection is not an illusion. Jesus did rise from the dead. And we will see him again. Because of the empty tomb, we know our Redeemer lives. 
Because the tomb is empty, we know he will return. Because he's going to return, we know we will see him with our own eyes and we will spend eternity with him. We will see Jesus walk on this earth. Because he lives, we live. Write it in a book. Engrave it on a rock. I know my Redeemer lives. I know he is coming again. And I can't wait to see him. Amen? Amen. I serve the risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see His hand of mercy, I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. Salvation to impart You ask me how I know He lives He lives within my heart In all the world around me I see His loving care And though my heart grows weary I never will despair I know that He is leading Through all the stormy blast The day of His appearing Will come at last He lives he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good 